is the holiday episode of Monday Night Raw, because I believe next week is a best of, and therefore, we put a stupid hat on. Why do we do this? Nobody knows. Also, how the hell is it December 2023? Somebody dig my grave already. That was a little bit dark. Also, welcome, my friends, to another episode of Ups and Downs and one of the last of the year. So thank you very much for sticking with me. And yes, what culture peeps are having a very much well-needed break. So I'm on editing duties. So if anything looks weird, it's because it is weird, because it's damn bauble. It's annoying me. What a way to kick things off with the last proper roar of 2023 too. Because who came out to say hello? It was the Judgment Day. But they really did look cool during their entrance. I was like, man, you're such a nerd for thinking that, but I did. And tonight is the night when Finn Balor and Damian Priest defend their tag team titles against the Creeds. So of course Finn was like, oh, Julius and Brutus. This is the biggest night of your life, but for us, it's just another day at the office. Rhea Ripley also just went after Ivy Nile, mostly because they are friends. When yes, Dominic Mysterio tried to speak and everyone went, boo, boo, and they weren't saying boo words. But Dobby Boy recently signed a five-year deal with WWE. So a massive round of applause for him. He is one of the breakout stars of the year. It also meant that all was right with the world, which was doubly true. Because R-Truth then interrupted. He was like, what are you doing, guys? You didn't tell me you were coming to the ring to opening Raw. I love opening the show. He started to do his dance. He's also just decided that he is in the group now. Because even though they beat him up last week, clearly that was just his initiation. I tell you. I love the fact that R-Truth is back with WWE. He genuinely makes me happy. He got even better too because he called Damien Priest DP, which broke Damo and he had to turn around to stop laughing. And this is when I noticed his shirt. It was the Judgment Day shirt, where it does have all of their names. And on the bottom, R-Truth had a bit of paper and he'd stuck his own name on it. How did we ever deal with him being away from the damn show? And he gets you emotionally. That's what he said. He's like, like, I know you beat me up physically, but it really hurt deep down in my tootsie toes too. Because of all this, he had come up with an idea if they do want to fight, him and JD McDonut should engage in a miracle on 34th Street fight. This is when JD was like, dude, that's already been announced. Everybody has been talking about it for the last week. I did have his own spin on it though, because he wanted to make it interesting, because yeah, we should clash, but if you lose, you're at the judgment day. And if I lose, I'll be out of it too even though he's not even in the damn thing. DP thought that was the best idea ever, although Rhea Ripley didn't see Keen. So once again, we are planting no seeds. Of course, as we were already all out here, we did have this stupid, ridiculous, ludicrous gimmick match. I just had such a good time watching it. I mean, nobody took this seriously because you weren't meant to take it seriously. So you could just sit down there, grab some popcorn and have a good time. And remember that, having a good time, sometimes I think wrestling fans forget it. The condom kept interfering too, which must have been doing a number on our truth because he'd be like, man, why are you attacking me? Although of course at one point, Dom grabbed his foot, our truth chipped up and he landed right into McDonald's balls. Because that was always gonna happen. Now, I assumed he was gonna lose for obvious reasons, but then my word, they were tussling on the top. JD McDonough was gonna hit him with something, but after he basically head our truth truth fell down, he took JD with him they crashed through the table when Half Truth was laying on him. The ref was like, all right, one, two, three, and Half Truth won. I honestly stood up and popped because I'm a weird guy. Now, of course, we did play this off like it was a massive fluke. I'm just going to tie everything back in here. I just had fun. There it was F U N. And that's all I need in my life. I am but a simple man. And it's absolutely getting it up. Kane and Carter and Katana Chance then cutting a promo on Chelsea Green and Piper Niven because they believe they are going to win the women's tag team titles later. I'll let you win on a little spoiler. They weren't lying and they actually went and did it. Ooga lally. Before that though, we did have to continue to set up matches for our day one episode of Raw, which obviously is coming first of January 2024, because out came Nia Jax. Now she didn't get to say anything even though she wanted to because Becky Lynch interrupted her instantly. And I was like, <laughs> they think it's the start of Raw again. Nobody told her. Becky did want to chat too, but Nia wanted none of it. And she was like, listen, if you do come near me, I'm going to break your face again. Instantly, I got on the phone to Nick Cage. Jax then decided she was just going to declare for the Raw Rumble. So don't forget, in January, when people have to qualify, you can have a good old laugh. Well, we kind of went inside baseball here. Because Nia Jax was like, listen, Becky Lynch, nobody back there, as in the backstage area, wants us to have a match because they know that I kill you and you're their cash cow. So like, what is going on? It's also why, even though she did break her nose back in 2018 or whatever it was, they have been kept apart. 
And Bex is like, well, that ain't true anymore. And I'm happy to fight you right now. Get in this damn ring and I'll tonk you. This all then continued because she was like, you only got hired in the first place because of your cousin. And yes, that is The Rock. And let's look at your CV. Your only claim to fame is that you broke my nose. That's why you keep going on about it and everybody is bored. So when she does get the one, two, three, and now I will have nothing left. This is when Jax was like, all right, fine. Get a referee out here. We'll do it right now. And she just changed her mind. I was like, Naya, you just wasted this person's time. She did have one final line, though, where she promised to send Becky Lynch to the local medical facility and make her face look so bad that her daughter goes, Mum, why do you look uglier than usual? I was like, Becky, if your child is saying stuff like that to you, she needs some damn manners. Basically, the officials did try and break this up, although they weren't watching Naya at all because she attacked Becky from behind. And yes, we are going to do this in a couple of weeks' time. Becky Lynch will win. Then I suppose she'll go on to the Royal Rumble. They'll get into it again. Lynch will win the damn thing when she challenges Rhea Ripley for WrestleMania. That's when we could all get excited. So I think this could have an up. I like the fact we are tying into past storylines. Never going to get mad at it. Kofi Kingston then decided, well, I would like to be the best thing about this evening. So he arrived as Kofi Claus. It's just the best, man. They clearly sat around and went, is Kofi Claus fine with everyone? Yep, let's go and do it. He also asked DIY what they wanted for Christmas, and they said the tag team titles. It's, like, it's a bit of a tall order. And Kofi agreed with this, so instead he gave a Yeet t-shirt to Johnny Gargano. Actually, John was really happy with this. His son loves Jey Uso. It worked. Him and Tommaso Ciampa also went to shake the Miz's hand, because they're all friends now, and they believe he can beat Gunther later for the Intercontinental title. I tell you this, Miz then cut a promo, and they were all so good, I was like, wait a minute, is the Miz actually going to get Gunther? They reeled me in. It didn't help because this match was next, and the Miz lost, but man, I tell you, if you want to go and see one of the most welcome surprises of 2023, you got to tune into this match. Totally won't really rocked. Because WWE really did play with the fact that throughout 2023, Gunther has been one of the best wrestlers in the year. So maybe just before he got to 2024, he was going to lose his championship. Now, once again, he didn't. But these two absolutely killed him. Now, of course, Gunther did start with chops. Even though Miz was trying to come back with his own. I was like, Miz, this is a terrible idea. But all of a sudden, the Miz was busting out a bunch of submissions that I've never seen him do before. I mean, I absolutely swear he did the Indian Deathlock at one point, but all that did was piss off the Intercontinental Champion, and he grabbed him and powerbombed him into the ring apron. Pretty sure that's the hardest part of the ring. Hang on. Because look, I'm wearing this hat, and I bet this hat is not harder than the ring apron, right? Oh, I was wrong. Miz then went for a springboard nothing. That was a terrible idea, because Gunther grabbed him before he booted him right in the head. When they were fighting on the outside, the ring general went for a chop and all of a sudden the Miz's brain was like, well, why don't we just get out of the way? He did. And Gunther chopped Rita the ring apron, Rita the ring post, I should say, which meant his hand was now wounded. Even then, Miz decided to hit a trio of DDTs. I was like, that doesn't affect his digits. But this is when we started to escalate the damn thing. And I tell you, I've said it once, I'll say it twice. I started to believe. I mean, even when the champion was able to apply the Boston Crab because he was so weak, Miz was able to get to the ropes. I was confused here. It was two plus two equals potato. It's like, why is Gunther doing a Boston crab? He's from Austria. The absolute best one, two, ooh, for me at least, is when Gunther applied the sleeper, though, and Miz turned it into the most devastating move. In all of sports entertainment, there's a prize roll up for the one, two, ooh, but then he hit a skull crushing finale, and damn it, he got me again. But that was mostly because he had smacked the hand beforehand, but he got a 2.9999. When they went to the ropes, he hit an avalanche skull crushing finale, and I kid you not, he actually had the former Volta beat. But what did Gunther do? He was like, ha ha, I'm smarter than you. And he rolled out the ring. And they had done such a good job. What did the crowd do? They all went boo. It really did work as well because he was able to lure the Miz in. He gave him a bomb of power. He smashed him with a clothesline before he hit another power bomb to get the one, two, three. When he kind of stumbled out of there like, ha ha, I don't want any more of this. It also means further stipulation the Miz is never allowed to challenge for the Intercontinental title again as long as Gunther has it. But don't worry about that. You can take that whoop, and throw it over there. Give them their flowers. This was an absolute treat getting it up. Then another quick video reminding you that the Creed brothers are totally nuts, but that's why they're also awesome. When we saw Gunther walking in the back, and Imperium were going, oh, you did it, we're so proud of you. Now, he didn't fly at all because Gunther slapped them down instantly. He was like, what are you even doing? I've had a great year, and you two have been nothing but disappointments. He's definitely their dad. He then told Ludwig Kaiser and Giovanni Vinci that he has taken a fortnight off, but in that time, they better work and they better grind so that when we get to 2024, they can start pulling their worth. I tell you, these two dudes are totally screwed. I mean, how are you ever going to appease Gunther? You can't. I'm now starting to think maybe it's Ludwig who turns and he causes Gunther to lose his title. I mean, that would tie in 
when Kofi Claus arrived, gave them a present. And you know what it was? A lump of coal. Kofi Kingston thought this was so damn funny. He got me, I laughed. And then, well, Shinsuke Nakamura was here, and apparently he has written a book that was called The American Nightmare Before Christmas. And all I'm going to do is read it to you, because I cannot do this justice. Because it was the week before Christmas and out from my mouth, came a warning to Cody that Shinsuke would pounce. While your daughter is nestled or snug in her bed and visions of championships dance through your head, Shinsuke is plotting to live out your story to ruin your plans and extinguish your glory. The nightmare is over, the nightmare is through, the mist burns its eyes for the nightmare is you. You bastard, you cancer, you prancer, you nitwit, your vomit, your stupid, your father was inbred. So my goal is to see that you're living in fright Merry Christmas to you. I will be your last fight. I was like, all right, Shinsuke, calm down. So he has gone totally crazy. And a small word of advice to the parents out there. If you are planning to read a book to your children on Christmas Eve, don't pick this one. They'll be super duper scared. It is such an amazing turnaround for Shinsuke Nakamura, though. And this is when Cody Rhodes attacked him. So I was laughing again. I was like, Cody, why did you wait for him to finish this story? And I thought, maybe that's poetic irony. They, of course, brought around the place until security stopped them. They essentially saved Nakamura here. I was like, did you not hear what he just said? You gotta let him kill him. This all finished with Rhodes standing tall and looking really mad. So I suppose we'll probably get to that day one Raw show and we'll do this rematch as well with a stipulation. But honestly, this was so over the top in the best possible way. And whoever wrote that, well, seriously, well done. You're totally insane, but it definitely worked. Chelsea Green and Piper Niven were then going, please, Adam Pearce, we don't want to defend our titles. And I was like, well, you are, so would you go away? When Bronson Reed walked in and said, ah, oh, good day, mate. I've heard you've been talking about Gunther and what to do with that there IC championship. They sat down to chat about it. This was the same with Ricochet and his lot recently. The fluff is going on. This also meant that it was time for our women's tag team title match. And here is the deal. 2023 hasn't been the best year for those belts. So we basically hit reset here and going into 2024, Let's light a fire under him. Because it was Piper Niven and Chelsea Green taking on Katana Chance and Caden Carter. And of course, at the start of this, Piper just cast power and she was chucking everyone all around the place. She's really strong. The issue is Niven and Green really don't get on that well. So when Piper was going to do a big splash, her opponents got out of the way and she crushed Chelsea instead. I was like, that may come back to haunt them. They were then able to get back on the same page, but they did hit a code breaker sent on combo, although Chance broke that up at 1 2 ooh. When we switched it, because the challengers hit the keg stand and Chelsea broke it up at 1-2-0. I was like, I don't know what's going to happen. I really did think that one set of these tag team titles did have to change hands. Otherwise, why do the women's and men's on the same evening? That's when I was proven right. Yes. Because as Chelsea was going for the unpretty, a chance was able to reverse that. She hit a code breaker when she told her partner to get over here like she was Scorpion. They hit the after party, which is a really good double team maneuver, by the way. And yeah, they got the one, two, three. And everybody cheered. Now, I will admit, if this was the plan, we could have probably built up a lot better. But again, I'm going to go back to what I just said. We have to do something with these championships in 2024. And Chance and Carter, they've got like a good spin to them. So we should be able to do that. So I'm going to give it an up. I thought it was more than fine. And I enjoyed the December title change. WWE does like doing that. The Alpha Academy were then hyping up Ivy Nile because she does want to face Rhea Ripley on the 1st of January Raw. When, yep, Tazawa had told us that he had gone to Adam Pearce, well, we saw this earlier, and demanded a match with Ivar of the Viking Raiders. I was like, Tazawa, you crazy. But the Viking Raider and his voodoo queen showed up instantly, so they were just right off camera. And even Chad Gable and Otis were like, Tazawa, what are you doing, man? This is a terrible idea. Somebody spiked your drink. But they hadn't. We were about to get it. Before that, though, Kofi Claus was back, although he went up to Caden Carter and Katana Chance was like, Whoa, what do you want for Christmas? And they basically went, well, the tag team titles. And Kofi was like, oh yeah. And they got really bizarre because they dragged Candice Theray and Indy Artwell off to a party when Natalia and Tegan Knox was here and they were like, somebody needs to be number one contenders for the women's tag team titles. So Shayna Baszler and Sorry Stark walked in and said, yes, we should be the number one contenders. And now they're going to have a match in a couple of weeks. <laughs> This was the biggest geese title shot ever, but I laughed and therefore I liked it. And then, yeah, Tazawa got killed. Of course he did. Now, we did actually tease throughout this that maybe the unthinkable was going to happen, because when we gave Tazawa these little hope spots, my word, he's a good wrestler. We forget this because he does his dance, but he's flubbing brilliant. The problem is he just kept getting killed by Ivar, who gave this horrendous clothesline. And look, the main reason we did this is because the Viking lost last week, or whatever it was, to Bronson Reed. We have to give him a win. So he smashed out this avalanche world's strongest slam. 
Uno Dos Tres. That said, though, I actually like both of these guys. And moving into the new year, you could do more with both of them. They do have a massive upside. As I've said that word, I shall give it an up. It was an entertaining squash. It was then time for more day one stuff. That show is flubbing ridiculous. Now, you should note that CM Punk was not on this week's episode of Raw, which has upset a lot of people. But Seth Rollins did come out and he was like, look, I've been a pretty damn good champion in 2023, but you ain't seen nothing yet, friends. 2024, I'm going to be even better. Damn right. This all starts in January when he does take on Drew McIntyre for this title. Of course, you can't say somebody's name in wrestling. Out came Scottish Warrior. He was in a very interesting mood. As Rollins was insta-mad, given the last time they'd seen each other, Drew had head him. But McIntyre was actually like, no, I respect you. I'm here to be a nice guy today. Because while everybody else is kissing CM Punk's ass, you told him the truth, and I massively respect it. He also doesn't need to fight Seth Rollins at the moment because that match has already been scheduled. When my word, he went emotional roller coaster here because he was like, listen, man, you don't understand my journey. I got to go home recently and I looked at my dad and I was like, oh my gosh, you've got so old and all the parties I've missed and all the sicknesses I've had to ignore because I was trying to live my dream. And actually, Seth, you may get it because look at your wife, Becky Lynch. She has had this same journey too. We have to be transatlantic all the time. Sometimes it's really hard. He knew that Seth had been through this a little bit as well, because of course it is the story for all professional wrestlers. It's a damn hard existence. But that's why he needs to win this World Heavyweight Championship, even if he has to kill Seth Rollins. What a turnaround that was. It's just so good though, because Drew says these words, and they are absolutely true, and you kind of do feel for him. But he's also such an asshole, but you never know what you're going to get. Rollins then picked another direction, because he was like, listen, I do understand what you're saying, but why do you think match two is going to be any different from match one? Because you're still not looking in the mirror, Mr. McIntyre, and you refuse to accept that you're to blame. Seth then reminded us that he had told Punk last week that he hated him and he meant it. Although actually, when he sees Drew McIntyre, he don't feel no hate, man. In fact, he feels pee. So I'm bringing out my Hangman Adam Page reference. That's number two. Now, obviously, McIntyre was offended by this. So when Seth Rollins tried to walk away, he just beat him up and honestly, he grabbed Seth and threw him into Barry Barricade when he picked him up and hit the Alabama Slam on the hardest part of the ring. That looked absolutely horrible. So I've got all fantasy booking mode now. That means I'm being a nerd. Because maybe, just maybe, CM Punk does cost Seth Rollins the World Heavyweight Championship and then Drew gets what he desperately needs. Either way, I love the fact that so many top stars are plugged into all of this. It makes it so damn interesting. And yeah, these two have great chemistry. I like this a lot. Cody then made sure to remind you that he is a good guy because he found the creeds and he was like, thanks for helping me last week, boys. And make sure you win the tag titles this evening. When he left, Julius and Bruce was like, oh my God, it's Cody Rhodes. And they marked out, they're going to go far. And WWE did something I wasn't ready for. Then I let their thoughts run through my brain. I was like, oh my gosh, it could be brilliant. So it started with Kofi Claus coming to the ring because he finally wanted to give some presents to the fans. When Imperium came out, they just beat the crap out of him. And they did kind of deserve it. He gave them coal. Of all people, it was Jay Uso that made the save, though. And then from nowhere, someone said, well, why don't we do Ludwig Kaiser versus Jay Uso? And here is the deal, my friends, my pals, my buddies. Do you know who won? It was flipping Jay Uso. Well, I did freak out a little bit because Kaiser is going to be killed when Gunther hears about this. But even though Giovanni Vinci was casting distraction the whole time, Jay was able to hit the spear. He got the big splash and he got the one, two, three. Now, of course, Kofi did come back out during this and he took out Vinci. But that is not the point. Surely Jay can now get to 2024 and be like, oh, ring general, I beat your boys, and I now want to challenge you for the Intercontinental title. Like I say, after pondering on that, I think we should absolutely do it, because it would totally cement everything we've done with Jay Uso in 2023 by giving him a championship that means a hell of a lot in 2024. I mean, at the very least, he should be in the conversation, but there's also Bronson Reed and the rest of those guys. So do a big number one contender match, then yeah, make it happen. Jay Uso for IC champ 2024 giving it up. And then the best part of Raw actually happened, because look at this. We cut to the Judgment Day in the back, and Damian Priest was still going, <laughs> JD McDonough, you lost to R-Truth. Now that was at the start of the show. This was at the end, meaning Damo had been laughing at this guy for three hours. Ripley was super pissed as well, because a loss for one of them makes them all look like goobers. When Damo was like, look, sorry, McDonough, you've got to leave. You know the stipulation. JD then almost cried, because he doesn't want to get kicked out when Priest did change his mind. When Rhea Ripley was like, right, we have to get serious now. Because in 2024, I'm going to annihilate Ivy Nile when Finn took over and said, yeah, we're going to do that right now too. Because it is time for the tag team match and we're going to win. So seriously, a massive round of applause for these guys because they have had a great 12 months. I mean, they ain't going to last long in 2024, but that's all right. 
I've enjoyed it muchly. And it's time in two because it was time for our main event with the tag team titles on the line. Damian Priest and Finn Balor taking on the flipping creed. Now, I actually thought we could have gone full in with Julius and Brutus here because they definitely have something. Once again, I'm like a broken record. But because they're so out of control, they bring a form of entertainment that nobody else does. That is going to see them good. It also would have helped the Judgment Day story move forward. But at the end of the day, we come out of the other side and do the creeds feel like they're headed in the right direction? Yes. Yes, they do. As usual, Julius just tagged him, started throwing people around when Brute was got the hot slap and did the same. When Rhea Ripley decided, oh, I don't like you, Ivy Nile. So she went to beat her up, but Ivy reversed this and just threw her into the ring apron. I was like, look, that was impressive, Ivy. But now you definitely lose in that match. Julius then hit this most ridiculous standing shooting star press, even though he is massive, when man, they hit the Brutus ball number one onto Finn Balor. Damien Priest broke this up at the last second. I bought it, the fans bought it. I thought they'd done it. Finn was a stuck a Phoenix down in here too, because all of a sudden he was back on his feet and he was going for the Coupe de Gras. It was actually Julius that broke that up. When they smacked Damien, they gave him the Brutus ball number two. And you gotta go and watch this, because Brutus landed right on Priest's head. I think he was pretty pissed off about it, as you would be. And Baron actually broke that up with the Coupe de Gras from the top, which was also awesome. When all of a sudden Brutus stood up, he speared Finn Balor out of the ring. This is where Damo just went rah. He hit the big old choke slam, and he did pin Julius for the one, two, three. But I tell you this, I think Julius kind of moved his shoulder at 3.5 seconds. I don't know if that was meant to happen. Either way though, Damien then did just hurl him out of the ring with a rage of a thousand suns. And I just hope he is okay, because he took a blow to the noggin. But ultimately, it meant that Raw in 2023 ended with the Judgment Day standing tall with their championships belts. Rhea Rip was all like, ha ha ha, we have done it. I think that does tie in. This was a super fun main event. And again, if you keep treating the creeds like this, they are going to fly. They have something very special about them. And I'm going to give it an up. And this Raw overall gets an up too. Seriously, it's actually one of the best of 2023. It kind of felt like a pay-per-view premium live event. But let me know I'm wrong in the comments. Overall, it does get an up. Subscribe, like the video, share the video, you know the deal. And look, on the screen right now is ups and downs for AEW Collision. I'd appreciate if you watched that well. But in case I don't see you before Christmas, have a lovely day. Enjoy your holidays. And this wrestling train keeps on moving because wrestling never dies. One day I will, which means sports entertainment will outlive me. What the flub are we talking about? Goodbye.